Good evening. Welcome to Comas Google Hangout uh, for GE13. This is our first in the series for the next few weeks. The nation is on a high. We've been waiting for a long time for the elections to be announced. The good news is parliament is dissolved and uh, election dates are going to be announced soon. And we are here for a good discussion for one hour on a Google Hangout with two very important personalities from Malaysia to discuss on G13, what is at stake. Uh, with us today, uh, we have uh, Dato Ambiga Srinivasan. I think you can see her on screen. And we also have uh, a very good uh, civil society leader from Sabah, Tansri Simon Sipaun, who's uh, on the other end. I think you can also see him on screen. Uh, Tansri, you can wave in case they may mistake you and me. Yeah, that's Tansri Simon. And my name is uh, Gerald Joseph. I'm on the, one of the board of directors for Pusat Komas. Uh, I think I don't need much uh, introduction to these two personalities. Just a brief introduction. Uh, Dato Ambiga uh, has been leading the nation through a series of people's movement asking for a very basic and simple thing in any democracy. She's asking for a free and fair election. And she's our leader, the chairperson of Berse 2.0. Berse 2.0 is the official name of the, of the organization. But this committee has organized uh, a series of different uh, uh, demonstrations demanding for free and fair election. You can just Google it right now. You'll see the excitement and the energy of the people who are at Berse 1, 2, and 3. Uh, Tansri Simon Sipaun is well known in the Sabahan circles, in the Malaysian circle. At present, he's the chairman of Persatuan Promosi Hak Asasi Manusia. This is not Sohakam, eh? this is Pro Ham. Uh, the good news is uh, Tansi was also a commissioner of Sohakam before. So he's very well versed in human rights. He's well versed in Malaysian history and present quality. Most of all, he's well versed with, with the Sabah. He, he hails from Sabah. So welcome to Dr. Ambiga and uh, Tansri Simon. Welcome to join us on this first of the series of uh, five uh, Google Hangout for the GE13. Uh, Kawan-kawan yang sekarang live online, selamat datang ke Pusat Komas. Uh, Pusat Komas adalah NGO, uh, badan bukan kerajaan, uh, pusat komunikasi masyarakat yang sudah 20 tahun di Malaysia. NGO yang kecil tapi suara agak besar. Kerja mereka melawan diskriminasi, bekerja bersama orang asli, membuat program uh, untuk pilihan raya untuk selama 20 tahun ini. So sekarang uh, kita diambang uh, pilihan raya dan kita telah mengurangkan siri satu siri diskusi uh, live online ya yang dipanggil Google Hangout uh, PRU ke-13. Hari ini perbincangannya adalah apakah yang harus dipertikaikan yang uh, sambil kita berdekat dengan uh, tarikh uh, PRU 13 yang tak lama lagi. Uh, with that, we will continue our discussion. So the format, uh, friends from Malaysia and all over the world, welcome. You are free to make comments, ask your questions live. I think you can see the information on the, on the poster. You can give it by Twitter, Facebook, uh, Skype. Uh, anywhere on the Google page itself, uh, the team is waiting for your comments. Please feel free and we will pick out some comments. Only limitation is time and that will be uh, passed on to our two uh, esteemed speakers and then we will have an interactive discussion. So to get us going, uh, Dr. Ambiga, uh, the format is a few minutes to start us off on this GE13, General Elections 13, the nation has been waiting. So what's at stake? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gerald. Um, saudara saudari, salam sejahtera. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so what is at stake in PRU uh, 13? I would say that the future of the country is at stake in the next general elections. It is a closely fought contest. 
Um, our institutions are at stake. We will have to see how our institutions function. We have seen how they functioned before. We need to see how they're going to function over these elections. Uh, free and fair elections as an institution is at stake. Uh, of course, we are also concerned about enforcement, uh, about uh, institutions that fight corruption, and so on and so forth. So all this is what is at stake in the next general elections. In other words, democracy is at stake in the next general elections. Now, we are going into an election where the playing field is not even. Uh, I will go into more detail about that, but we know for a fact that the electoral role is far from satisfactory. We also know that the uh, access to media is not free and fair. Um, what Bursi has tried to do is to raise the standard of conduct in the next general elections and we, to do that we have launched a code of conduct both for those who take part in the elections as well as uh, for those who are in the position of caretaker government. Now I just want to say a couple more things. Uh, one is that change, I know a lot of people, change seems to be a bad word for a lot of people. It is not a bad word uh, and I have news for those who say don't change. Uh, the news is change is already here. Change has already been happening uh, and um, it, even uh, if Barisan wins the next general elections, I'm afraid there will still have to be change. They, it cannot be business as usual. And the reason for that is because we, Malaysians, have changed. So um, I see corruption as one of the biggest issues going into the general elections. I think both parties will have to address how they're going to deal with the issue of corruption. Um, and the other issue is political violence. I won't go into that. I will wait for questions on that issue. But what I would say is that our role as voters is critical in the next general election. By going out to vote, you can actually mitigate some of the effect of the uh, discrepancies on the electoral roll and the uneven playing field. Now, Saudara Saudari, Dengan jika saudara saudari keluar mengundi beramai-ramai, kita boleh lawan penipuan dan juga kita akan mengukuhkan demokrasi di Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, this is as uh, someone said, Dr. Bridget Welsh actually, this is the Rakyat's election. We have to take ownership of it and we have to make democracy work. Thank you. Thank you, Dato uh, Ambika. That's a, a good opening that uh, change is already happening. So what's the question about is change okay or not okay? I think that's an affirmation of the Raya, the people of Malaysia who has already embraced change. So I think uh, thank you for telling the nation to enjoy change, to embrace change and uh, and really be happy with, uh, with change happening. So. Uh, doesn't matter which party wins this election, yes. the agenda of the riot is already rolling yes. for change. Yeah? So Tansri, over to you Tansri, uh, from the uh, other end of Malaysia, giving us some insights on GE13, what's at stake. Thank you, Gerald, for having me this evening. First, let me clarify, I'm not a politician. I've never been one. I'm not a member of any political party and most probably will remain so for the rest of my life. I am not pro-government, I am not pro-opposition, only pro-good um, governance and pro-human rights. Okay, back to the team. The 13th general election, what is at stake? To me, simply put, the country and its citizens' future is at stake. Our future, your future, my future, everybody's future is at stake. Will, will it be a bleak or a bright future? This depends on the government that is going to be chosen by the people. One characteristic of democracy is that the people are given 
the opportunity to elect the government of their choice at regular interval. However, the actual process is much more complicated. Democracy cannot function properly under any condition. For example, it requires a reasonable standard of literacy and a sizable middle class. Democracy and good governance go together. Governance is the process of decision making and how these decisions are being implemented or not implemented. The main characteristics of good governance include participatory, consensus oriented, accountable, transparent, responsive, effective and efficient, equitable and inclusive, and follows the rule of law. Good governance assures that corruption, which Dato Ambiga has alluded to, that corruption is minimized, if not eliminated. The minority views are taken into account. The voice of the vulnerable groups are heard in decision making. It is responsive to the present and future needs of society. Democracy needs clean electoral rules, free access to the media, a level playing field, free and fair election, among others, so many things. Uh, do you want me to continue or shall I stop for the time being? Okay, Tansri, thanks. We'll take that as a starting warm-up to get some more reactions. Uh, I have a question already that is coming in, and I think I'll link that to your point as well as Dr. Ambiga's point about the playing field that is not uh, level. Eh? Maybe a little bit of description, but the, the comment by one of the uh, uh, viewers, his, I'm just, his or her comment is, looking at the current government, I believe that they are doing what is, the necess what is necessary for the people. Isn't this what the opposition party is asking for? So I think this person is saying that the changes already are going in the direction and is done by government. Do you all agree with his statement or not? And I probably link it with the playing field that is not level. Dr. Ambiga? Well, I mean, I think it's up to the people to decide that question, whether they think the present government has done enough or whether they think uh, what the opposition has to offer uh, is better. I, I think ultimately the goal is go better governance, as Mansri has said. Now, I don't think enough, sorry, I don't think enough has been done at all to make these elections free and fair. Uh, let's look at the media. Let's look at the way the Barisan Manifesto was presented live on all the television channels uh, and uh, the Prime Minister and the, uh, uh, Dr. Sri Najib could actually uh, deal with the manifesto and explain it over uh, I think about an hour, an hour and a half. Now what are they offering the opposition? 10 minutes pre-reported time. That in itself should speak volumes. Okay, Tansu, you want to take it on from there on other points about the playing field, whether it's level or not? Media has been mentioned by Dr. Ambiga. Okay, um, I'm just one individual. I think it is not fair for me to make judgment. I agree with Dr. Ambiga, it is the people. But Malaysians from Peninsula have known the same government for the last 56 years and Malaysian in Sabah and Sarawak for the last 50 years. They are familiar, they have seen how this government operates and in action for the same government, no change so far. If they are happy and satisfied with the same government, then the logical thing to do is to give them the opportunity to continue. Um, but if they feel that they see this government as not practicing what I indicated earlier as what I call good governance, then they should know what to do during this coming election. Only the people themselves can answer this. Now, in my view, the people are more knowledgeable, they are more informed of current affairs, 
with the availability of the internet and other modern means of communication. Their literacy standard a lot higher. Their expectations are also a lot higher. I believe there is a sizable number of young voters also. Unlike in the past, it is now, in my view, getting more and more difficult for the government to hide the truth from the public. They are now in a much better position to assess the performance of the government, especially those living in the urban and semi-urban areas. So um, on that uh, note, I think uh, I better stop because once I start talking, I tend to get carried away and forget when to stop, unless you remind me. Thanks, uh, thanks Sanstri. No, definitely you are very well much within the time. I think that comment about the riot, the people having grown, I think that's what Dr. Ambiga said in the beginning, that change is already happening. Maybe we can uh, try to discuss in the G13, what's the changing riot impact on this GE13? Because you, uh, Tansri has said that uh, it's a more uh, uh, educated crowd, there's a younger population, you can't hide the truth. That's some of the things you've seen. Dr. Amiga, what do you think of the, the riot? Well, I, I think uh, really politicians will be making a mistake if they insult the intelligence of the riot. And by that I mean if they think smear campaigns and political violence is going to work, it's not. Uh, the people are far smarter, uh, and I tell you something: they really, the rakyat have a strong sense of decency. Um, I, I saw that. I don't have to go into mm -hmm. the examples, but they really don't like uh, uh, conduct un that is unbecoming. That's that's one thing I've learned about the Malaysian people: is not acceptable to them. So I think uh, that's why we brought up the code of conduct. We think there must be a high level of conduct in these next elections. I think the Rakyat are looking for statesmen, not just politicians. They are looking for statesmen. They know that when they cast their vote, they're not voting just for the candidate. They are voting for themselves and for the future of the country. That much yeah. the people of Malaysia have uh, come to be aware. And that's why the 13th general elections is so important. Dr. Ambika, can you just give one example? What's the difference between, because for Raya, it's what statesman and politician, what what will differentiate between a statesman and a politician? Give an example of one conduct from the code of conduct. Well, I would expect the statesman, for example, to immediately come out and condemn unacceptable conduct by his party. So let's say his party is involved in political violence, a statesman will come out and say, this is unacceptable. That's only one example. There are many examples. A statesman rises above petty differences, rises above politics, and puts the nation and the people first. Thank you. So uh, that's a very good example eh, of uh, the political violence in Malaysia that has been increasing the last, uh, the last few months, I think. And sadly, the ones who react to it has been the victims, the political parties and mainly its opposition. Per se has been making statements, NGOs have been condemning. But I think what Dr. Ambika is saying that political violence is a no-no <laughs> for both sides of the divide. Yes. Uh, a true principal politician who is what now called a statesman or stateswoman will stand up and say, I will reject all forms of violence. So I think this is a very good message that as a rakyat, as Tantri has said, a rakyat is now lebih pandai, you know, we've, we've, we've grown. The nation has grown, the people have grown, and people are now watching with, uh, looking at the fine details. You can't really, as Tantri said, tak boleh tipu, you can't trick them. You know, you have to tell them the, the, the full truth. So I think, uh, uh, Dr. Ambiga's message probably is linked to your versus uh, banner here, if you can see. It's calling for uh, all of us to reject political violence, but I think all of us have been rejecting political violence, but the call is for politicians 
to state that we do not condone political violence. And that we will vote against them if they condone it. Okay. So this is what we are at stake now. GE13, you are coming to the riot to ask, please vote me. And Atta Ambika has just given you a criteria for evaluating the candidate. If the candidate has kept quiet on political violence, that means definitely no, no. Tansri, can you give another example of a difference between a statesman and a politician? Well, Gerald, it has been said the politician thinks of the next election. The statesman thinks of the next generation. Oh, okay. I agree <laughs> with that, Omega. Oh, the statesman <laughs> should think in terms of the long-term interests of the country and its people. So the politician thinks in terms of his whatever immediate political uh, gain. Anyhow, to comment on the 13th general election, I think it will be the most hotly and tightly contested election the country has seen since um, uh, so far. Um, before the 12th general election, it was fairly easy for the incumbent government to win so easily with two-third majority. However, things changed drastically during the last 12th general election held on 8th of March 2008 in which the BN for the first, I'm not quite sure this one, first time or second time, uh, but anyhow it failed to obtain the usual two-thirds majority and the opposition captured initially five states. Perak was subsequently um, lost to the BN amidst a lot of controversies. The 12th general election, in my view, the results indicate a move towards the right uh, toward the right direction in terms of development of two-party system in the country. I think, in my view, this is a good move and it is in the right direction. Since then, there is, I notice, more multi-racialism in the membership of political parties. The political culture has been dominated uh, by too much racial and religious sen sentiments, I think, for far too long. And it is not bringing the country uh, anywhere. It has tended to polarize society like never before. And it is not conducive to the um, creation and maintenance of genuine national unity and integration so vital to a plural society. I see now people uh, generally a bit and feel that for the first time in the country's political history there is a real possibility of changing of the God taking place especially if there is level playing field clean fair and free election people tell me that if an actor has been on stage acting far too long it is only natural for the audience to expect a different actor to, to come into the stage and see if he is a better actor than the last one. If he is no better or worse than the previous one, he or she can always be changed during the next election. I think this is how democracy should work. Generally, I feel now Generally, people like to see change, but not change for its own sake, but change for the better. This could be a good pattern for the future. I stop okay. here for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Tansri. I think a very important point of a two-party system, and I think democracy is only alive when we can show we can handle different political forces, different political ideology coming in and out, and the nation is, continues, you know. So, uh, Tansri has said it very well. He says that the change of God would mean versus a demands. You know, the free and fair election, uh, clean electoral road. He said when the system works, people void can be translated into their vote. And this is where we are at the, at the point of the nation now, asking, we are about to go and make the choice.
Versailles has helped put the people's demand up with the 8 uh, plus 2 demand, uh, but there has not been, there does not seem to be a very good uptake of the demands. At the most, I think one and a half or two. So what does a nation do at this point when Versailles has worked so hard together with us for this change? Well, uh, you're right. It's one and a half or two in yeah. that. <laughs> Um, the indelible ink uh, has been implemented. We're not very happy about the way it's being implemented, but let's give them a mm -hmm. tick on that one. Um, as far as the other things are concerned, and these are really critical. The electoral role is unacceptable that we go into an election with the electoral role in the state that it is. Um, the lack of free and fair access to the media, also unacceptable. Now the campaign period is uh, something else that um, they, they may give us a few more days. But of course, I don't know that people will be complaining too much because we've been campaigning for two years. <laughs> so, uh, but you need a long campaign period to take account of the overseas votes. You must not forget that. The postal vote system hasn't really been uh, overall as we wanted. Uh, the overseas vote system is still unclear because it was implemented so late. Uh, of course, we have the politic koto and the violence that's still there. So there are a lot of things that are still not done, not fulfilled. And those eight demands were only for PRU 13. Eh? There are other demands which are long term. We can talk about that another time. But the whole point for Berse is that we get to a multi-party democracy, which is what Tansri has said. And there is a very important point to be made about multi-party democracy. And it is this. It actually means the power then lies with the people where it should. Because if you have free and fair elections, then it is the people who decide whether this government stays or that government comes in. It then keeps all these parties on their toes. You will have a reduction of corruption or you will have strengthening of institutions. I can't even the knock-on effect will be fabulous. So that's what we are headed to. And that's the reason for the eight demands. That was meant for PRU 13. It's not happening. There's no level playing field. But we can try and mitigate the effect of some of that by coming out in large numbers. So you're saying that uh, despite the success, one and a half or two of the eight, at this critical point, you're saying the only way to mitigate it is let's come out in large numbers yes. and vote. Is there anything else that is happening that will also help mitigate the... Yes, uh, Percy has launched its uh, citizen observer project. Uh, so we are going to be our own our, uh, observers of our own elections. It happens around the world. It has been seen to reduce fraud and uh, as well as uh, political violence and so on. So the fact that so many people are watching these elections is important for us and I think that's another one of the ways in which we're going to help. Uh, okay, that's a very good message uh, because uh, many of us are asking, uh, we've, we've struggled, many thousands have gone with you Ambi to the street and they are saying that we've, we've demanded, some have been met, many have not met, but now we need to decide and the message is clear, go out, vote, go out, be the eyes and ears to also minimize if there is anything that is not right with the coming election. Tansri Simon, I'm going to go back to your comment earlier, which is a very Malaysian issue for 50 years of Sabah Sarawak Semenanjung or 56 years of uh, whole Malaysia. This issue of uh, racial uh, problem, multiracialism, racism, uh, which is normally the color of a lot of the politics of our country. Maybe you can start by sharing in this coming election, how will this be seen in the Sabah politics in the coming election? Uh, General, actually Sabahans, uh, there's no, we don't experience racial problems the way it is being um, uh, played in Peninsula. Uh, but I think I'd like to point out that uh, at this point in time, the election is just around the corner. I think it is important for the members of the public, particularly Sabahan, 
to be aware of the role and understand the role not only of the government but also the opposition. People must realize that the government is merely that what I call the trustees of the people. It is duty bound to take care of government fund. Get, not abuse, huh? take care of government fund and government assets and not to abuse them because they are the trustees of the people. That is why there are so many rules and regulations um, involved in the management and administration of public fund. They are meant to minimize, if not eliminate, abuses and irregularities. It is the duty and responsibility of the government to bring development to all parts of the country, irrespective of whether the, are, the areas are represented by government representatives or um, opposition representatives. It is not the duty of the opposition to formulate and implement development projects utilizing public funds because it has no access to public funds. You know why I mention this? Because I often hear politicians from the government side telling people there is no use electing the opposition because it cannot bring development. And to the ordinary Kampong people, you know, it, 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 it appears to be true. But it is, not, it is not the responsibility of the opposition to bring and formulate development. How can they? They got no money. They cannot spend public funds. The responsibility of the opposition is to provide what I call constructive criticism and keep the government on its toes. It provides the necessary um, checks and balance. The opposition provides an alternative government for the people. This is the essence of democracy. The opposition has therefore an important role to play. It is not bad as painted sometimes by the government. So the voters need to be made aware of this. Opposition is required in a democratic system of government. Therefore, public awareness of democratic system of government, I think, is very important. I, I stop there for the time being. Thank you, uh, Tansri. That's a, a very good point. I think it's linked to what uh, Dr. Ambika was saying earlier about the code of conduct for government. Because the main point you are saying that the uh, utilization of public funds or the budget of the government are in the hands of the government of the day. So you cannot accuse the opposition of not building a road because that's not their duty. It's a treasury and it's the government of the day. And that's a very good message that needs to go out because many Malaysians cannot differentiate political party, the BN, and government because for all this while we've had it together. So that's a very good message to all our friends, our brothers, sisters, uncle, aunties, mothers, fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers out there, that separate this two. Whoever gets voted in, you have the public funds. But on that note, uh, Dr. Ambika, the call on the ut utilizing of the public fund as caretaker government, you know, that's been the debate. When does that line come in? When do you? When does a minister sign off on something? When does he or she stop? Is the giving out of the brim one uh, election ploy, or is it duty of the government? So that's uh, quite new because that debate has never come up in Malaysia, and I think Berse for the first time is probably taking out in a very systematic way. Maybe some comments. On that. Yes, I, we've come up with guidelines on uh, caretaker government, which we've taken from internationally accepted standards. Now, uh, Malaysia is a member of the Inter-Parliamentary Union and they have come up with guidelines for elections and so on. So, we cannot plead ignorance uh, about these standards. Of course, caretaker guidelines are based on convention. Uh, I think the Attorney General said today there's nothing in the Constitution. Of course not. There isn't because it's a convention. 
uh, it is good conduct, it's good behavior of a government who is in caretaker mode. And what that means is you cannot enter into uh, new contracts, you cannot make big policy decisions. Now, the rationale for that is that you cannot do anything that will bind the incoming government unnecessarily. And that, not unnecessary, but not at all. Uh, so that's the rationale for caretaker government. So yes, I think what is healthy, and this is, this is why I say change is already here, uh, is that we're talking about caretaker guidelines. We're talking about caretaker government. And even if the Attorney General did make reference today to some of the things that a caretaker government cannot do. So that debate has never ever taken place. So, you know, it's very healthy for the country. Thanks, uh, Dr. Ambikas. I think uh, this is a message out to all governments, state and federal. Eh? Absolutely. Yeah, that uh, you are in power, you can still sign the check, but you have a moral duty not to, to take on this because you never know who's the new government. So they don't sign on something that they will be stuck with and that's the free and fair way yes. in any democracy to just maintain the government functioning. Status quo, yes. Yeah, status quo for this moment that everything is running but don't enter into any new agreements, contracts, anything new. And that's the message. Although you have the, the, the power at your hand, please learn. And I think the uh, Interparliamentary Union, IPU, is a, a bipartisan body of parliamentarians from all over the world. And I think the Malaysian members are members from the Barisan National and the opposition yes. uh, MPs who have participated in the meeting that came up with this. So uh, it's both houses that agreed to this standard. It is time to, to, to get into action. But, I, sorry, you know, can I just add sure. something here? But the delivery of service must continue. It doesn't mean you can everything stops. Yeah. And part of that delivery of service, by the way, is security of the nation. So the police have to carry on doing their job, for example, in stopping violence, etc., uh, etc. Et so all those things go on. Delivery of service goes on. That's important to know. Okay. Thanks for the reminder. This is a message for politicians. Jangan lupa tugas sebagai kerajaan juga. That's the message by Ambika. While you're busy campaigning, you still have to make sure delivery of service continues. We have a list of many questions. Tan Sri, banyak soalan untuk Sabah. I think Sabah is a hot topic sekarang. Saya nak tanya sikit. Eh? Uh, they think, uh, Tan Sri Simon, what is the ground sentiment like in Sabah? Do you expect to see any shift in voting trends? But I'll link that to, to another question. How many percentage would you say the opposition campaign is able to penetrate Sabahan voters? You may not know the answers, but this is the questions that are coming up. And there's a third question linked to Sabah that maybe you can take it all in, at one go. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the impact of the Lahad Datu incursion or the conflict there on the coming G13? Thank you, General. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, all right, thank you. But before I uh, respond to the question, uh, let me just, um, it just crossed my mind about um, this uh, caretaker government. I think in this respect, the civil service has a, a lot of role to play. Civil servants are implementers, translator of government policies into action. They are also official advisor to their political masters. They know better what should be uh, what should be considered not uh, against this caretaker philosophy and what in line with caretaker philosophy. So I hope the civil service will play its role in advising the government. If not, if the verbal advice is not taken uh, heed, please put the advice in writing. Uh, who knows, there may be a changed government, then they may have to uh, uh, defend themselves. <laughs> All right. Let me now say something about the Sabah situation. First, whether we like it or not, the presence of the unusually large number of illegal immigrants has permanently, permanently changed the 
economic, social, cultural, and political landscape of the state. It is alleged that hundreds of thousands of them have been granted um, citizenship in return for votes for the current government. To me, to me, it indicates a very cruel and uncaring attitude towards the interest and welfare of genuine Malaysians of Sabah origin. Can you hear me, Gerald? Yes, I can. Very well. Be because I like this to be heard by Sabahan. Yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely. To me, this is very hurting, to say the least. This is Malaysia that I never expected. Thus, the BN government refers to Sabah as its fixed deposit. Now the invasion in Lahadatu, uh, to me, was something only waiting to happen. I am surprised it did not happen earlier. This problem also, in my view, will not go away overnight for the simple reason that there are hundreds of thousands of them already in the state at the courtesy of the government. There is no way, there is no way of knowing with certainty where their loyalty lies. Being Muslims did not prevent the invaders from killing members of the Malaysian security force who were also Muslims, except for one. Not only killing them, after killing them, they mutilated their bodies. What an inhuman act of cruelty. It appears that the government was taken of God. It is now causing many Filipinos to return to their country, which is to me a welcome and positive development maybe for Sabah. The Lahadatu invasion indicates how vulnerable Sabah is in terms of outside forces and in respect of security. However, the follow-up actions taken consequential to the incident make the hundreds of thousands of Suluks, just Suluks, there are many others, you know, uh, among the illegals, already in Sabah who have been granted citizenship rightly or wrongly, as well as the right to vote, may now have second thoughts as to who vote for in the coming election, especially when the security forces are perceived to be harassing their community. Of course, I admit, this perception could be real or imagined. The so-called fixed deposit might not necessarily be left in the same bank now. Barring, then going back to the uh, actual situation related to the coming election in Sabah, I think barring last minute change, it appears that the coming 13th general election in Sabah will see multi cornered contest among the BN PR, SAPP, STAR, KITA, and possibly independence. I have yet to meet a Sabahan who is not in favor of one-to-one -one contest, namely between PR and BN. It would be less confusing in their view if there is no multi-cornered uh, contest. However, under the circumstances, the best scenario will be a three-cornered fight uh, between PR, BN, and either SAP, SAPP, STAR, or any of the other uh, newly formed parties or independents. However, I think the major players will still be PR, and BN. It has been said that politics is the art of the possible. 
past experience indicates that what is impossible elsewhere, it is possible in Sabah. At this stage, I still do not rule out the possibility of one-to-one -one contest between PR and BN, at least not on nomination day. There is a saying that has withstood the test of time. United we stand, divided we fall. Sabah needs political leaders who are prepared to make sacrifices and place more importance to the greater good and public interest over their personal and vested interest. I've got some wish list here, but I leave that a bit later. Okay, thanks, thanks, Tansri. Uh, I think this is a very difficult uh, topic, eh? and Tansri, I think you did very well in giving us an overview, giving us the truth on what's on the ground and some feedback from people. I think uh, we are very saddened by the the deaths of our own uh, soldiers the inhuman uh, the killings. We also said that there were victims on the other side because was the conflict necessary? Could there be other ways to have uh, avoided this? I think this is something that the nation will grapple with for a long time. But I think at hand now we need to ask the question on how do we treat people in Sabah? And I think uh, Tansri has said that this has been a, a long ongoing uh, issue. Hundreds and thousands of people have come, as he uses the word, the courtesy of the government. And they are people who also profess uh, religions of our, of our country. Uh, but now we have to deal with uh, this phenomena on, on them wanting to vote. And I think that's why you said it very well. You said that uh, uh, you're not even sure who their loyalties would be politically, even if they have a, a, a blue IC, rightfully, or uh, illegally got and the final point I think that the so-called fixed deposit is now not very fixed which means that possibility for democracy to be alive is really happening there and I think you say that hopefully it won't be so confusing for the Rahiyat to choose if there's a, as a bigger array but I think it comes back to the question that uh, there are generations of people from the neighboring countries Philippines and Indonesia who have lived in Sabah either through design or because of the porous borders and now we are suffering this phenomena that was not handled but we are at the brink of the GE 13 and many people have fears about this blue IC, instant IC going to vote and there's been all kinds of uh, fear messages, violent messages either on video or statements coming out against uh, migrant community, people from uh, outside living in our country for election. So in a sense, a kind of a growing xenophobia, you know, the fear of the other is coming on and it may not be very healthy for our nation. So Dr. Ambiga, maybe a comment on this point. Uh, I just want to say that whatever the RCI has disclosed in Sabah uh, has been happening in West Malaysia as well, in Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, there have been a padding of the rules. Um, the problem that we have is that because the courts do not scrutinize the rules anymore because Section 9A of the Elections Act, uh, it's very hard to challenge uh, some of these findings. And all we can do is bring it to the attention of the EC and then leave it to their good officers to make changes. We don't know whether it's happening or it's not. Uh, but more importantly, uh, political scientists like Dr. Ong Kian Ming have been studying this over a year and he's produced so many examples of uh, uh, possible entries of uh, foreigners and, and uh, as well as other discrepancies but unfortunately despite his bringing it to the attention of the EC not much is done so this is the problem that we seem to be playing with all over Malaysia but having said that what I do not agree with and do not support or condone for one minute is this xenophobic response to foreigners in this country. I think whilst we can use the art of persuasion before the elections to say, you're most welcome to work here, uh, but please don't participate in our political process, that's fine, that's gentle persuasion. But to frighten them uh, and intimidate them, as I think is, seems to be happening now, is 
totally unacceptable. Uh, that, uh, so that cannot be condoned at all. Thanks. I think I hope the message goes out. Huh? Kawan kawan di luar, walaupun kita rasa marah dan uh, mungkin tertanya-tanya kenapa ada uh, uh, mereka yang datang dari luar negara yang dapat uh, kad pengenalan dengan serta merta dalam sejarah Malaysia macam di Sabah sekarang dan uh, kita tertanya-tanya adakah mereka akan keluar mengundi dan mengubah pola uh, hari pengundian ya tapi apapun berlaku kita harus mengikut uh, cara beradat dan undang-undang seperti yang dikatakan oleh Dato' Ambiga jangan kita persalahkan semua orang. So kalau kita jumpa orang di luar bukan semuanya uh, uh, melakukan kesalahan atau terambil ter, uh, mendapat uh, IC uh, biru itu. So apa yang dilakukan janganlah menjadi anti uh, orang luar negara sebab negara kita dah berjiran dah lama. Banyak, ramai dari mereka yang bekerja di sini. We don't want to to create uh, an atmosphere where it's us against them. So thanks for that uh, for that message. Uh, we will continue with the, there's a whole list of questions here now. There's a question here for uh, maybe I think Dato Ambiga. Nak tanya Dato Ambiga boleh tak? I'm sure boleh lah. Jika kerajaan yang memerintah memerintah tidak dapat melaksanakan seperti janji-janji di dalam manifesto dalam tawaran parti masing-masing, bolehkah rakyat menuntutnya kelak? Question is that if uh, the government of the day that wins doesn't uh, fulfill the promises of its manifesto in the party prior to election, can the people demand for fulfillment post election? Of course. In fact, you must keep the government on its toes, uh, all, all of them, state government and the federal government. Because ultimately, you have to remember that they are there to serve you not the other way around. Uh, you are the boss, in other words. So you must make these demands of the government continuously. And what I would say is that we're at an interesting stage in Malaysia because for the first time, you can actually compare the governance of the opposition, which is the Pakatan Raya. They're actually the government in some states. Uh, and the federal government. Of course, it's not necessarily like for like because state government is far more constrained uh, than the federal government. But in their policy, in their treatment of uh, integrity issues, in their treatment of corruption, in their treatment of um, uh, what do you call it, public funds, uh, in their spending habits, those are differences that you can make, that those are comparisons you can make. So we're lucky, actually. You cannot say that you're voting in a vacuum this time around. It's not a vacuum. You can actually judge their conduct to some extent. And ultimately, you make that decision. You want a clean government. We all want a clean government. We want an accountable government. We want an honest government. Uh, and we want a government who respects institutions. And if that's the case, then you should make that choice uh, based on what these governments have been doing in the past. Uh, thank you for, for that point, which means that after election, we cannot take a break. The riot will be noticing every detail, conduct of what the government does, both state and federal. So now we have come to the end of the five years. We are doing an evaluation, both uh, Pakatan, state, and the BN at the federal level, to ask the questions that were promises before, what has been achieved, what has been not. And I think your question is a good question to say that we cannot just work hard till election day and then we smile. We continue for, for five years. Tansri, on this comment, uh, if there's a question here about what is the reach to the rural area, uh, in a lot of the discussions we are having, probably it's uh, more in the urban centers. Uh, like your comment about uh, rasa takut atau rasa resah, the fear of the water in the rural areas uh, or the, their own feeling, are they satisfied? Do they want this one-to-one -one vote you're talking about? Or they also feel, now what do we do with the uh, hundreds of thousands of people who supposedly has been given blue ICs under the uh, 
project uh, Sabah before. Thank you, General. Uh, before I respond to that one, let me just um, clarify that those foreigners who are here, legally or illegally, their human rights must be respected. I have no reason to blame them for being in Sabah. I only question the authorities why they were allowed without document to walk in and out of the state. Huh? That is, their human rights are no more, no less than any Malaysian, you know, and they must be respected. I think, uh, let me uh, make clear on that point. Going back, as I said, as I alluded to earlier, in Sabah, in the rural areas, especially the literacy, stand, the literacy standard of the people are much lower. Therefore, the appreciation, their awareness, the understanding of democratic system of government is very limited. To them, although it is improving, but to them, you give them one five hundred dollars today, uh, they think the government is good, but they don't realize that. The money would be better spent, better used by the government, you know, because $500 today, it goes two or three days time, no more. So back to square one. So this is the difficulty, making them understand. However, it is improving because, as I said, the older people like me may not uh, be able to read and write, but their children go back and explain to them, you know, what is happening, you know, in the state, what is happening in the country. And they got, I think they got enough sense, they got enough intelligence to decide which government, whether the present government has been given them the government that they wanted or an alternative government that has promised but not yet proven. Okay, I can go on and on, but <laughs> allow me, I, I got some wish list, you know, um, before we go. I, uh, Tansi, I'll, I will give you the last comment on your wish list we, before we close. We'll probably take another 10 minutes, a little bit more past 10 okay. uh, to close it. So you'll get your, your time for wishes. Thanks, thanks for that, that, that comment. Uh, Dr. Ambika, the role of uh, the riot, uh, I think he, uh, Tansi also spoke about uh, the riot wanting more and the uh, knowledgeable, but it looks like GE13 is always about political parties making promises and they like the center stage. So what is the role of social movement, civil society, union, trade union? There was a question here saying that just a few days ago there was a big uh, bank union demonstration of 10,000. What's that link with the GE13 and what's all the role of different movements for the GE13? I think, uh, so, okay, let me start by saying that what has really changed us as a nation, in my view, in the last five or ten years, is number one, the growth uh, of civil society, number two, the uh, internet and access to information, because that's something that was controlled before, and number three would be a strong opposition, because what it means is we are getting more information. And that's where civil society plays its role. Now, while everybody, political parties are on electioneering mode, we should be scrutinizing their manifestos. We should be trying to uh, advise people and have discussions about the kind of Malaysia that we want. So that's the role that we continue to play. And I think we need to say, like the union, hey, we're still here. We still got these issues, you know. To sort out so please don't forget about this and don't forget about that and uh, that's where civil society plays a huge role i wish i wish and i'm not talking about online media i'm talking about other media mm -hmm. mainstream media would also play their role they are not playing their role for the right yet in my view and journalists to me are in the best position to inform and that's why kudos and credit goes to the online media and those who are much fairer in their reporting, they are doing the right yet a favor. <coughs> those that don't are not serving the right yet. Thank you. Uh, 
as we're coming close to the end, there's another uh, interesting question. I think uh, somebody's also asked me before this, uh, when some of the NGOs have been going for discussions with people on the ground, there's been some question of fear about uh, what if uh, PR does win in this election. And there's a question here also, what do you think will happen the day after G13 if PR were to win uh, Putrajaya? Uh, that's a kind of a question based on our history, maybe on fear of, of change. So, Tansu, maybe you can go first with that. You're talking to me, Gerald? Yes. Ah, to me, I have great confidence in the leadership and the institution that we have uh, been following all this while. And I think indication, past indication is that there will be a uh, peaceful transfer of power, in my view, you know. Uh, there's no reason why it should be, uh, we should have great problem for ourselves. Thank you. There is a very sharp, quick answer, uh, Rata Amiga. Well, to me, actually, um, look, we all have each other, and it is in our hands whether uh, at the end of the day, we are going to see a peaceful transition. Uh, promises have already been made, and as Tansri says, I have uh, confidence in our military, and, and, and I think the police will rise to the occasion. Um, and by all accounts and things that we're hearing, it should be fine. Change is never easy, you know, but as I say, we're already in the process of changing. But what I would say is that we need a leader who is going to pull the nation together after this GE13 because I see it as a very divisive uh, election. A lot of healing needs to be done. A lot of truth and reconciliation has to be done. Uh, Sabah, for example, everywhere. So I actually think we need to rebuild this nation again, no matter who wins, because there are a lot of wounds. There are a lot of open wounds that need healing. We really need a strong statesman to take us forward. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, the sentiment is that we have uh, a history of nonviolence. We've tried to manage as best as possible, and let's use that goodwill to continue. Tansri has said that, the Ambika has said, and uh, we again call for statesmen. Doesn't matter who wins. Yeah. Yeah. And you, who's going, you're going to win and form the government. You have a big responsibility because this politics of this nation has been a little bit divisive and you need to bring them together post the election for, for the future. Uh, just before the last comment, uh, the two questions, I think a little bit technical. Uh, Dr. Ambika, they want to know that the standards laid out on this uh, code of conduct, uh, is it following exactly? What is the criteria laid out by IPU? Is that the only reference point? So that's a question. No, we've looked at a few. We've looked at the IPU. We've looked at the on caretaker government. We've looked at the some of the Australian codes, uh, the English code, and we've also looked at the model code of conduct in India. And then we've adjusted it to our local uh, uh, situation. We, we took us a lot of time before we arrived at that. In fact, the EC was supposed to have come up with the caretaker guidelines. I mean, I wish they had, but at the last minute they said they were not going to do it. And I, But I think it's important, and as I say, we've taken a step forward because people are actually talking about the caretaker government. And here I was saying, I think it was the Slango State Government and the Penang State Government who returned the cars. Uh, that's, that's positive. So, you know, it takes a bit of getting used to, and I hope everybody will wake up to their role as a caretaker government soon. On this point, I want to pick up on what Tansri said earlier. He reminds the civil service, who are actually the main ones running the service delivery now. So all the director generals, you need to get on board, get this code of conduct. It may not have been a culture in Malaysia, but the call by Dr. Ambiga is that we can. We can make it a culture of, uh, of Malaysia. There's a question here, Dr. Ambiga. You've been working to reform, to change the SPR. <coughs> Election Commission, how do we compare to other Southeast Asian countries as an election commission? Oh, I, I, I'd rather not. Uh, I, I prefer to compare ourselves to the best okay. because we should be comparing ourselves to the best. 
uh, that's what we want. Why, why do we want to, you know, settle for even second best if we want the best democracy in the world? And I don't think we compare at all with the best. I'm sorry. But uh, you know Bursi's position. We think the entire commission should resign um, because uh, we are very concerned about the uh, uh, elections that we're going into. But putting that aside, I think, as I say, this is the people's election. So let us make it work. Thank you, Dr. Ambega. Tanishri, <coughs> there's a, a very specific question. Do you think uh, the Sabah government have a right to ban someone like how they did with Tien uh, going into Sabah recently? I don't think it is the right thing to do. As far as human rights principle is concerned, a citizen can move and live any way in, within his country. This is against the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I think, as far as I'm concerned, it's abuse of power. Can I add to that? Yes, it's also against the Immigration Act, by the way, because there's a specific provision that allows movement from West Malaysia to East, East Malaysia for political purposes. You don't even need a, you know, a specific, uh, visa or anything like that. You can go into uh, uh, Sabah and Sarawak for legitimate political purposes. So in my view, they have breached that legislation in banning Tianchua. We call again on all politicians to take on the criteria statesmen. Yes. Don't use the power, especially abuse it in this time, no matter the difference of ideology. I think we are calling for a different type of, uh, of political engagement this round and round. Hopefully the messages that we civil society have been calling, Tansri Simon at the Omega, will get to politicians because you're not going to win by might. You're going to be scrutinized on every detail. Right. right, yeah. You're going to be scrutinized by every detail of your conduct and by right. You know, and the right standards have been laid out by Tansri, by Dr. Ambiga, and by Bursi. As we come to the close, Tansri, I uh, want to give you the space to make your closing okay. statements for G13. Thank you. And then your wish list you. also. Okay. Uh, these are not all, some of the wish lists for the new government. <laughs> Minimize or eliminate corruption. How? Appoint independent commissioners rather than civil servant. Answerable to parliament. Similar to Suhakam commissioners. Have a separate prosecuting agency to handle corruption cases independent from the AG chambers. Petronas accounts should be made available to the public. After all, after all, oil and gas are God-given and rightly belong to the people. I see no reason why government should be so secretive about it if it has nothing to hide. The human rights institution, Suhakam, could be made more independent by appointing commissioners on a one seven-year term with no renewal. Suhakam Act could be amended to make it obligatory for parliament to dis debate the annual report, the composition of the civil service and government agencies should be made more reflective of the multiracial makeup of the Malaysian society. Meritocracy should be observed, practiced, otherwise Malaysia will not be able to catch up with other countries in a very highly competitive and globalized world. The National Training Service Program should be reviewed I understand it was started in December 2003 for 18-year-old youths. The course has a duration of three months. I further understand that one of the main objectives is to inculcate feeling of patriotism among the participants. I do not believe this could be done in three months. The feeling of love for the country comes from inside, from your heart, and should begin from kindergarten and right through your life. Also, you cannot expect them to be soldiers after undergoing three months course. I believe about three million billion, three billion ringgit has been spent between 2004 and 2007. At the same time, incidents of deaths, rapes, missing in action have been reported. My question is, is this program worth continuing in terms of cost benefit? 
have the desired objectives have been achieved, I think it's high time this would be reviewed. Government should be transparent about the Biro Tata Negara. I hear allegation that this is more to promote the importance of Ketuanan Melayu and cast aspersion that other races cannot be trusted. At present, the federal government, the government is only federal in name, in form, but very much unitary in substance. Too much power is concentrated at the center. Basically, the states are only left with land and local, local government matters. More power should be vested to the state through process of decentralization. A new ministry for indigenous people's affairs should be uh, created. Royalty rate should be reviewed. The government should sign and ratify the main core human rights uh, treaties, UN treaties. At the moment, only three have been acceded to. Article, this is important to me, Article 121 of the Federal Constitution should be repealed. And pre-1988, Article 121 should be restored. History, history should not be distorted by the people in power. I can clarify that, but no time. <laughs> in short, uh, finally, finally, uh, Gerald, in short, yeah. this country should be a much better place to live in. If good governance is observed and practice and leaders focus their attention on national issues and problems instead of much slinging activities. Now, finally, in any election, they are bound to be winners, they are bound to be losers. I hope the losers will be magnanimous in victory and the losers gracious in defeat. Thank you very much, Gerald, for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Tansri. This looks like a new manifesto that I have to yeah, give out right. because excellent uh, point. A lot of Rayat will agree. You've just summarized uh, the feelings and many things said, mentioned, and some are swept under the carpet. And I think this is the kind of hope, uh, uh, cumulative hope of the last 50 plus or 56 years. And many things are still undone. And I would uh, leave this list. I've written a one page, uh, Tansri. Maybe you want to elaborate and we can circulate this around to people to start thinking, to ask politicians, are they ready to take this up in uh, post-election? So, Ambi, uh, before the, the last comment uh, on your own uh, view and uh, hope for GE13, there's just one specific question, I think this is directed to Berset, and to all people, how do we take the message out to the rural uh, heartland? Is that happening? And in the in the light of possible provocation by maybe extremist group uh, in the Cherama, violence, political violence, what do the common riot do? Uh, yes, I think the issue about getting the word out to the rural areas is, it, that has always been a problem. Uh, people have always wondered whether Per se has to reach there. But we have been working with other NGOs. Per se is not the only one who is doing voter education. There are other wonderful organizations, including your own, by the way, uh, who are doing a wonderful job of that. So I think all of us are doing our best. Now, I, I saw a video a couple of days ago um, of a charama where Dato Sri Anwar was, and the crowd was listening, and there was the rabble rousers at the back creating a lot of noise. But what was interesting to me was that the people in front just ignored them. And I think that's what you have to do, ignore the rabble browsers because uh, bullies like to be seen and heard and they like reactions. The best thing to do is to remain calm, remain peaceful, follow the orders of those who are uh, looking after the security. I think everyone now knows that security has to be provided in many of these areas. So that, that is one thing. But I do know that there are many areas where this kind of violence goes on. Huh? And, and, and some people dare not even go in to these areas to give charamas. That is unacceptable. And this is where I will do my final comment about G, uh, PRU 13. Now, the Dr. Sri Najib signed a pledge, the, the Transparency International Pledge. And in it, amongst other things, he uh, 
promised ethical conduct. Now, I believe that he can actually set the tone. And if you look at his pledge, it's interesting, you should Google it and look at it. He said he wanted to set the tone. So I think he can. And it would be wonderful if he could come out and say, look, this is going to be a free and fair election. No more political violence, no smear, smear campaigns, no cheating, no putting up false posters and that kind of thing. It will be wonderful if he would do that. Uh, just as he made the announcement that any transition would be peaceful, that was a one that was good. Uh, I was also asked, look, what about those who didn't sign? And I know there are many who didn't sign this pledge. To me, it's irrelevant. We are still going to hold you to the highest standards of conduct. Please be very clear about that, whether you sign the pledge or not. Now, I, I would say that people, that one of the things, uh, Tansri has put it so well and he's covered every important aspect that we should be looking for. Um, but I would also add that I would like to see the setting up of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission because I really do believe, as I said, this nation needs healing. Uh, the way to heal is not by prosecuting every wrongdoer, otherwise we'll be doing that for the next 100 years. Uh, we need to take a leaf out of other books in other countries which are in transition. We need to also be very serious about corruption. We need to be very serious about asset recovery. We need to be uh, we need to even possibly look at amnesty in some instances. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, we need to stop this capital flight out of the country. Uh, so those are the two additional things. And I'll end by saying this. I, people should not be afraid to come out and vote. In fact, they should be excited about these elections. This is your chance, OK? Your vote is really, really going to count. And you are not alone. Uh, there are. Millions of us will be going out to vote on that day. So I, I would say go cast your vote, go early, uh, check your details on the SPR website, uh, make sure you're still voting in the same place, make sure you go early, cast your vote, and let's bring democracy back to this country. Thank you, Tansri Simon Sipan and Dato Ambika Srinivasan. That was an excellent one hour. 15 minute discussion. I think it has opened up the, the, the playing field for elections to move from political mudslinging to statesman conduct for, for democracy. I think uh, they have set out very high standards, both uh, very experienced in the history of Malaysia. They've put a standard where we should aspire. They've put the burden on politicians to be able to conduct themselves better, but they put the power in the hands of the rakyat to decide how these elections will come up. So with that, uh, to all the rakyat out there in Malaysia and overseas uh, who have followed this uh, discussion on Comas Google Hangout, GE13, what's at stake? Thank you for your questions and comments. We tried our best to take all your comments and questions, but the only limitation was time. And uh, to uh, all our friends who have been following us, kawan-kawan yang juga mengikut kita dari laman web di Malaysia dan di luar negara, terima kasih kerana bersama dalam diskusi dan perbincangan ini dalam PRU 13, apakah yang harus dipertikaikan. Ini merupakan diskusi pertama. Diskusi seterusnya minggu depan, hari Isnin, tanggal 15 hari bulan April, waktu yang sama, kita akan berbincang dengan GE13 tapi topik yang berbeza dengan ahli panel yang berbeza. Friends, I hope to see all of you all here next week on the 15th of April at 9pm for the next series in our GE13 Google Comas, uh, Comas Google Hangout. Thank you Tansri Simon from Sabah. I think you can give a wave now. And thank you to Dato' <laughs> Okay, Bye-bye. Thank you, Tansri. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right.